Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. Today is the final day of hearing, so we're pretty happy about that. Of course, then the hard work begins afterwards. But this morning, I wanted to first turn it over to Susan Barrett for an executive director's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to let everyone know that our September schedule is on our website, so please have a look at it. And I'm just going to uh, highlight the many meetings we have scheduled in September for you now. Um, and if there are any questions, please reach out to us. So we'll be meeting again next yes, Wednesday, September 4th at 1 p.m. in this room. <coughs> On the agenda are the FY 2020 hospital budgets and potential votes. Um, then we have on Friday, September 6th, a data governance council meeting um, in this building on the fourth floor at 1 p.m. And then we come back to the Pavilion Auditorium here again on Monday, September 9th at 9 a.m. until noon to again discuss FY 2020 hospital budgets with potential votes. And then in the afternoon of Monday, September 9th, we meet in room 10 at the State House uh, from two to four for our general advisory committee meeting. Then we, we come back here on Wednesday, September 11th. Again, we have time set aside if we need it for the FY 2020 hospital budgets and votes. And we, our, our very last scheduled uh, potential day of uh, discussing hospital budgets and potential votes is Friday, September 13th, which I don't know if we should read into that too much, but that is the date. I would say um, any hospital that's still in discussion on Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, the, and at the end of today's meeting, we're going to hear from the hospital budget team about the next steps, but the orders, um, the, the rate and the NPR will be uh, sent out to the hospitals by September 15th, and then the orders will be sent out by the end of September, the written orders. Um, and then, then we're beyond hospital budgets at that point, and we uh, hear on September 18th um, from UVM, uh, medical Center on their milestone report for their psychiatric investment. We also hear a one care um, quarter, quarter two update. And then that meeting starts at 1 p.m. Then at that evening on Wednesday, September 18th, in our uh, Green Mountain Care Board offices, we are conducting a primary care advisory group meeting, which starts at 5 p.m. And last but not least, on Wednesday, September 25th at 1 p.m. in this room, we'll be hearing of V-Cures, that's our all-peer claims database, um, V-Cures in Action, examples of how Vermont's claims data are used to understand and improve care. So we'll have a panel discussion on that. And then I think we're going to need a vacation after that month. But. So it's all on our website. Please refer to our homepage. Thank you so very much. There won't be any vacation because I want to give a teaser trailer to October 2nd. Oh, very Because good. October 2nd, um, we're having a panel discussion here on um, an issue that really has been seen in every single possible budget <coughs> presentation, and that's workforce. And it's an issue that threatens access, it threatens quality. And it also threatens cost as we try to compete with others since there is not an adequate supply of docs and nurses and, and other uh, medical professionals. So um, that should be a, a really uh, good presentation on October 2nd. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Joe and his team. But before I do, I'll ask Sonny, the court reporter, to swear you in. Okay, and Joel, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come up and, and talk about both our budget and some of the real uh, meaty issues that um, we, as, uh, along with a lot of other hospitals and HSAs, are, are dealing with in Vermont. <coughs> I'm um, joined this morning uh, at my far left, Teresa Tabor, who is our controller. To my immediate left is Wendy Fielding, who is the Vice President of uh, Financial Planning for Dr. Hitchcock Health, uh, 
the, the larger health system that we are a member of. And to my right, um, uh, whom you all know, David Sample, my, my CFO. So we'll jump right into it here. I know that we have had, under my leadership, a tendency to run very long. Uh, we'll try to rectify that uh, today, but I'm sure that we'll have uh, a lot of good discussion, so no promises. Um, our agenda, uh, as directed by uh, the Fremont Care Board, I won't review each uh, item right now, we'll get to it. An aerial view of our shot, I'd like to point out our solar field. We are an um, uh, incredibly efficient uh, hospital in stewarding our natural resources. I don't think we can pick up, it's too pixelated, the sheep, the flock of sheep that we have every year that uh, does our mowing for us. People uh, love to park up there. Um, our mission, to improve the lives of those we serve. We are, are kicking off another strategic planning exercise right now, um, incorporating some of the language and taxonomy around our system strategy that we've worked on at the system level for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, our mission or purpose statement will remain the same. I think it's simple yet, yet powerful. Our org chart is, uh, as you can see here, nothing has changed uh, since last year. I do want to make a quick note out of our assisted living community, the historic homes of Runnymede, uh, and right in downtown Windsor. We, uh, it's a tough business to be in. Uh, we found a way to make it work, and I think importantly, especially in the setting of uh, the affordability questions that we have uh, in the state around healthcare and around extended care, uh, we've been able to make it work with the majority of our patients uh, being on Medicaid um, as the primary payer. Part of that has been working with Diva to get uh, waivers for sicker patients. We found that the trend is, and it's an admirable trend, is that folks are staying at home longer uh, because of wraparound services, 24-hour care, um, and then making the jump immediately to a nursing home, or frankly, to a, to a hospital uh, when they get too sick. Um, However, that leaves out a, a vast population of Vermonters that don't have the ability for 24-hour care, and don't have um, uh, long-term care insurance to help pay for assisted living. Um, so we run a, a, a pretty lean uh, operation there, but we've been able to stay full, and when we look at the more, uh, the higher-end assisted living facilities around our community in White River and other places, they're empty because, frankly, Vermonters in our region don't have the money to be in, a, in an atmosphere uh, or a very high-end um, uh, facility. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. It's taken a lot of work, um, and it was a, a, a business that I wasn't sure was going to be sustainable over the long term, but we've been able to keep it going and actually um, uh, get into a much stronger position. So our most valuable assets are our 490 employees. That's part-time, full-time, per diem and 183 volunteers spread across our three clinical sites, and that's in Windsor, primary care clinics, and the, our full hospital in Windsor, our primary care pediatrics and PT clinics in Woodstock, and our ophthalmology optometry practice in Hanover, New Hampshire. I'll make a, a quick note that uh, we recently underwent a system-wide employee engagement survey with Press Ganey. Um, every system member Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, Health went through it, and we had the highest employee engagement scores of any facility in the system, and we're in the 85th percentile nationally on our engagement. So um, I think we are being seen regionally as uh, a strong and stable uh, place to work that cares for its employees, and uh, shown through on that survey. I'd say the most, the best part of the of, of our individual surveys was that um, in the patient safety and quality module, there were a number, I want to say somewhere between 10 and 15 questions about the culture of safety and quality at the hospital. Uh, every single respondent from our hospital uh, checked the uh, agree or strongly agree box. There was not one dissenter. No one was even neutral. Um, it's a, a culture shift that we have focused on the last five years. Um, and again, it came, uh, was very apparent to all like, with our survey results. So since 2014, which is when the ink uh, dried on our uh, affiliation agreement with Dr. Pitchcock, we've had about 6,000 referrals overall from all outside hospitals and over 5,100 just from Dr. Pitchcock. We've had over 1,700 admissions for post-acute care to our swing and acute rehab units and about uh, just under 1,500 admissions directly from DHC 
year to date, in, of, as of June of 19, our average daily census was 20.1 on swing and acute and 8.3 on acute rehab. Those numbers are very similar year to year. We, we built out our capacity in the last few years and have been able to uh, uh, stay at about those levels. Quick summary of this slide is there really is, aren't any sections or departments in the hospital where we are actively working daily on system integration. Um, I, I've, I've said this at prior presentations here. Um, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. The pads are our bumps and bruises with integration, but overall it's been an immensely positive experience for our hospital. I think our general stability in the region um, financially and clinically uh, bears that out. Uh, being part of a larger health system has allowed us to enter uh, you know, risk programs uh, with uh, One Care Vermont, uh, knowing that um, we, we, we've got help if we need it, um, and that has been reassuring. Our current service lines at our clinic and hospitals are as listed. Everything in red is direct clinical support with providers, uh, docs, associate providers coming from Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. We are hoping uh, by the end of the year to compl complete a joint recruitment of a neurologist to help us serve our acute rehab patients. Most of our acute rehab patients are uh, uh, patients that came to us from Dartmouth Hitchcock Health with traumatic brain injury uh, after a, a stroke or some debilitating neurologic disease and we uh, we waste a lot of time and money putting people in ambulances to get them back up to the neurology appointments at John Fishcock. So working with their section chief, Jeff Cohen, uh, we've identified a couple uh, physicians who uh, hopefully we'll be bringing to the area and spending time at, uh, at Montescutney. Um, what you don't see up there are uh, really many surgical subspecialties. Uh, it's still not our, um, uh, really not in our portfolio at this point, um, which as you might imagine can make uh, revenue uh, challenging at times. Uh, there, I don't have a couple orthopedics or neurosurgery or, or other surgeons that are, um, you know, make, making hay for us in the long term to help cover up our warts. So uh, our challenge is make sure we don't have any warts. Make sure that operationally we're running uh, lean and uh, uh, keeping our expenses under control. So I will uh, also uh, stick with it before I hand off to Dave in a bit. You can see our NPSR budget to budget growth, 7.4% and the rate uh, requested goes from 2.94 to 3.2 and the change as, as listed there at 0.3%. Some of the hospital issues we're facing, um, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, it seems our workforce issues are stabilizing. Um, uh, in the while, while Dave cautioned me not to say anything, I, I can't help it. I just I feel like we're in a bizarro world where we're we're where we're considered, um, you know, we're we're offering comp packages to new employees, especially lower uh, employees on the lower end of the pay scale, that are actually better than some of our surrounding hospitals. Um, now that's taken work over the last few years to get there. Um, but uh, we've never been in this position before. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we we're able to uh, pay our housekeepers a little bit more and get our nurses, especially our nurses, up toward uh, a market range. That said, uh, you know, our performance this year has really limited our ability to make any market adjustments uh, for our folks. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. But we've moved, uh, mission critical positions have been filled by permanent folks. We we're less reliant on travelers. Um, you know, we, we, we have hired a few folks from Springfield, uh, a few folks from Valley Regional. There tends to be a, a somewhat mobile <coughs> workforce that does move around our three hospitals that are all about 20 minutes apart from each other. Um, and regional instability uh, in, in both Claremont and, and Springfield has led to some exodus of workers uh, from those regions. Um, as I said, we, we have over the last few years been able to do market merit raises each year uh, for three years and made significant retirement contributions. A lot of that truly was catch up in nature because for years we weren't able to do anything. 
And I've already mentioned our, our employee engagement scores. It's something we're, we're very proud of. Primary care provider turnover remains significant. This slide is largely a carryover from last year. Uh, we have successfully hired uh, three new primary care doctors, two for Windsor, one for Woodstock, so that is great. Unfortunately, we lost a primary care doctor in the interim as well. So we're still net positive on FTE as far as gains in our primary care. Um, but we still have about 1,000 to 1,500 patients that are in the <coughs> ether out there. Folks were, who previously got their primary care with us, but whose primary care provider has moved on. Uh, so our project over the next six months with our new docs is to bring all of those people back into the fold because we're also finding that, hey, guess what? Those folks are still attributed to us even though we haven't seen them or they're, but they've been waiting for the new primary care physicians to arrive. I'll comment that we do have wage pressures as all, our, all institutions are desperate for primary care. And we're continuing to try to come up with a, uh, a solution uh, to the physician and provider burnout problem. I, I should say that it's, it's not just provider, but it's also nursing, it's healthcare burnout uh, in general. One investment we did make is uh, we um, brought a chaplain on board for the hospital and increased her FTE and the work was less around our patients. We had more than enough chaplaincy available for our patients. It was for work with our employees to build resiliency. So we carved out her time um, to do that work. And we're probably going to do a small physical plant adjustment in, in our chapel space, which is never used, to become really more of a, 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 a site for wellness um, and, uh, where the chapel can, can help to hold some resiliency work groups. Uh, on the ACO engagement side, again, under, under risk, um, you know, we, we, we're dealing with a few issues. Um, I, th I thank the Vermont Care Board, the representatives from CMMI, uh, specifically Fatima, and the folks at OneCare um, for helping us work through these issues. So they've, been, they've been challenging, um, and they revolve around the cost report issue that, that, that you all are, are well aware of. And then, frankly, just the, the, the 2.2 million of, of potential downside risk for our programs in, in 2020, um, um, I'll be very honest, our, our, our board, my board of trustees, was, was uh, not willing to go that route. It took a, a tremendous amount of discussion, a little bit of leverage, some uh, conversations with DHH, senior leadership, myself, all of whom feel like it's the right thing to do to be in the program, to stay in the program as we are now. We're all three programs. Um, but our board, with their fiduciary obligation, to and duty uh, to steward our financial resources, we got a lot of pushback. Um, uh, what little hair I have left uh, was significantly uh, decreased uh, over the last month or so, as I think the folks are at, on my table here uh, can attest to. Um, but the issues are, as, as we know, we have a small end for covered lives. In all three programs for 20, there's probably between five and 6,000 lives. In Medicaid, the example I'll use is we had about 1,000 Medicaid lives in 2018. Uh, one, one pediatric patient who had substantial um, orthopedic surgery at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock pretty much blew out our cost, our expense in that year. And if we have our attribution right, that same patient is uh, uh, at an outside hospital in another state uh, and probably um, uh, Blowing, again, blowing out our cost as, as well. Just one patient, it's, it's been a, a, a long healthcare struggle for that, uh, for that patient. So that's hard, there's not enough lives to spread that risk around. Um, and then we have you know, a little point of contention between myself, and again, I'm the, I'm the vice chair of the One Care Board, so a bit of a walking conflict of interest. Um, but we had to assign what we call the orphan risk of a very large, um, uh, primary care practice in White River Junction that does all its specialty work, imaging, lab work at Dartmouth Hitchcock because they're a lot closer than they are in Mount Scott. We've had no historical relationship with them. Now, thankfully, they're a great practice with great docs that do uh, excellent work for their patients. So it could have been a lot worse, but it's we as the, the Windsor and White River HSA are have that practice and all its attributed lives um, and all the expense that is occurring kind of outside of our, of our grasp. 
Uh, staffing, recruitment, and retention um, may uh, continue uh, uh, to uh, improve, um, dealing with wage pressures and the ability to, to uh, keep competitive packages to our uh, employees is something to keep a close eye on. On the housing front, we uh, did invest in a condo at the mountain, at, uh, at the former Montescott Resort, um, and we've kept that largely occupied with uh, either short-term housing for people that are moving into the area to take jobs for us and are waiting to see what community they're actually going to settle in, um, to putting uh, a, a locums uh, for anesthesia out there. Uh, we also renovated uh, a building on our campus to create a, a two-bedroom apartment um, uh, with a common living space, and we get that uh, full at, the le at least on the weekend. So I think it's a novel approach to the workforce. We've had to attract some of our technical positions or folks that fill those technical positions from as far away as uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, and areas south. And you know, if we can provide them a place to stay for three or four days while they're up here, I think that goes a long way. And then, yeah, Dave put that last bullet in. Uncontrollable inflation. Uh, we continue to balance. DHH system needs versus our needs versus ACO needs and, and uh, uh, state budget guidance. Uh, that's just an ongoing balancing act that, that we perform uh, every day. Uh, we are still dealing with patients uh, that stay with us who nursing homes will not take. I put the word limits in there in, in quotations because um, there's really no limit. It's just uh, self-imposed. We can only take so much Medicaid. Yeah, and I understand where they're coming from. They've got to keep the lights on and the doors open as well. Um, and then, as I said, we remain the highest referral recipient in dartmouth Hitchcock Health for subacute patients. That remains um, uh, one of our strengths in, inside the system. We have increased independence on other operating revenue. I think our, our, our budget bears that out in our reporting. On our 340B meaningful use funding. Um, healthcare reform program revenue, and then we continue to bring in significant amounts of grant funding year over, over year. In fact, uh, brought in a, a substantial grant from the Couch Family Foundation to support our uh, family wellness program, uh, which is remarkable, and I would encourage any board member uh, or staffer to come down and, and take a look at what we're doing for our high-risk families uh, in the Windsor and, and Woodstock areas. Opportunity, we're actively engaged in um, uh, regional planning. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, we've got three critical access hospitals within 20 miles of each other uh, with varying levels of uh, financial distress uh, at this point. Um, we really have to work on, uh, on uh, a better model of care for our, you know, 400 square mile region that these three hospitals serve. Um, there is un, uh, unneeded capacity probably at, at, at two of the three hospitals, or I should say un, underutilized capacity at, at, at these hospitals, and it just makes sense for us to kind of right size clinical services uh, and try to find a way that we can get all, hospital, all three hospitals to a point of financial stability and then move forward. And I'll say that Dartmouth Hitchcock struggles to uh, ex to extend their services to, to three hospitals. So I'll use the example of oncology. They send one oncologist to us, actually one and a half oncologists to Mount Scutney. They send an oncologist to Springfield. They send another oncologist to Valley Regional. While Dartmouth Hitchcock has a reputation of being this big behemoth, their oncology section can't afford to keep sending three people to three hospitals 20 miles apart. So we, we, need, to, we need to come up with a better way. And the urgency in Springfield is felt by felt by all of us. We're all we're all feeling it. Um, and I'll say that leaders from from all three hospitals are are are, are talking, having active discussions uh, to figure out how we can do things better. Uh, we are continuing to work on improving our primary care operations. I already mentioned we, we brought three new docs in. And I, it's un, uh, unfortunate that I have to report that um, a lot of the enthusiasm we had around our pharmacy or pharmaceutical formulary and PBM revisions have not been borne out. It's been, um, it's been slow going. We're going to keep chipping away at it. We um, still think that there is a, a larger health system solution. We think there's greater power in purchasing as being part of a, big, a larger purchasing group. Um, but we just haven't seen it yet. Um, we're going we're gonna to keep working on it. We haven't, uh, 
lost anything. We haven't really gained anything in, in a year. Um, and again, it's, uh, I, I regret to report that because there was a lot of enthusiasm about that last year. So at this point, I will uh, hand over to Dave. So uh, financial health indicators, a lot of my slides are things you've already seen in, in, in other materials that you've received. So uh, there's, there's our financial health indicators. If you have questions, I'm sure we can talk about them later. <coughs> And uh, same type of deal here on profit and loss statement. Uh, essentially, we're looking at uh, a 1% operating margin for 2020. And uh, that's what it is. Cash flow statement, uh, same kind of discussion here. It's just really born out of our, our uh, p and and balance sheet. Um, and then the 2020 uh, balance sheet, Slight improvement from 2019. Uh, and again, a lot of these things, you know, a lot of our uh, risks and issues are also uh, opportunities and vice versa. And so I will uh, be careful not to be repetitive uh, during the next few slides. We've talked about the, the workforce pressures. Um, we've done a couple things to try to improve um, work situations without throwing money at it. Joe referenced the on-call space that we have built out on campus. Uh, we now have a couple of unique shifts that we're doing with some technical folks. We have a radiology coverage uh, from Friday, uh, essentially at 5 p.m. until Monday morning at 7 a.m. where somebody is basically uh, living in one of the apartments uh, that we've built out uh, and is essentially on call, uh, has a certain amount of scheduled hours during the day, over the weekend, uh, but is on campus for the entire weekend. And the reason we did that was uh, we had a lot of pushback from radiology staff, which I'm sure is uh, commensurate with everybody else's experience, uh, where, uh, you know, call on weekends is a downer. And, uh, and, and, you know, with the weather in the winter, having to pack up and get back in to, to take call for a, a CT at 2 a.m. in the emergency room, uh, we felt like there was, it needed to be a better way to manage that. So. Uh, we built uh, this weekend coverage model uh, and, uh, and, and the employee engagement in that department in particular uh, was very strong in our engagement survey. Uh, we talked a little bit last year, uh, we uh, were in the planning stages of expanding respiratory therapy to three shifts. Why? Because call is a downer. And uh, so uh, we figured we'd skin the cat a little bit differently. Uh, we provide uh, three shifts of respiratory therapy coverage. And our hope was that some of the patients from our service area and other service areas around us um, would be able to come and we'd be able to accept more admissions that we had not been able to accept in the past because we did not have three shifts of respiratory therapy. What we found out is that that has paid for itself essentially during the course of this year and the employee satisfaction in that respiratory therapy department uh, has, has gone up dramatically because again, we don't have the ongoing call. If by chance we ended up having to take a vent patient or a complicated patient, uh, then people are pulling doubles and, and it just really was not a good uh, work experience. So we've tried some other ways as well and so just throwing money at things. Um, uh, Joe has talked about the primary care subsidy. Uh, the ACO reserves and cost report impact is, is an issue that we're continuing to work through and to try to get to the bottom of that, but it is clearly an expense driver for uh, projected 2019 and is built into our budget for 2020. Uh, swing bed cost report issue, there was an uh, interpretation from Medicare and their contractors in reviewing uh, cost report submissions um, that they wanted swing bed uh, counted a certain way during that settlement process. Uh, our 2016 cost report is, uh, was being audited earlier this year and they have uh, changed their position on how they would like to settle that out. Uh, for us, it was about a $392,000 hit, and that is uh, probably going to uh, affect every critical access hospital in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, and uh, will likely uh, continue uh, and be ongoing into the future. So we've had to recognize that risk for 2017, 18, 
19, and uh, we've built that into our budget for 2020. Uh, pharmacy inflation, I think you've heard enough of that, so I, I won't belabor that. Uh, and then one of the other interesting things is kind of one of these things, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing, uh, the move towards acuity. Uh, respiratory therapy that I just mentioned is probably the best example of that. Because we've been able to provide these services, our level of acuity uh, has gone up this year. And we're able to take patients uh, that are a little bit more complicated than we were able to take previously because we have three shifts of coverage. Uh, and, and so that's a good thing. I mean, it cost us money. We had to pay for a third shift we weren't paying for. Uh, but the flip side of that is uh, that we were able to draw patients back to their home community for who need those services. And it's, it's two, three admissions a, a month. It's not large numbers. Uh, but the other side of that coin for acuity is that it's taking more resources uh, outside of respiratory therapy, whether it's medications, uh, ancillary testing, uh, nursing coverage, uh, to, to address the needs of those patients. Uh, but it is uh, decompressing Dartmouth to a degree. Uh, which I think is good for all of us. Having uh, patients in the most cost-effective, clinically appropriate setting is always uh, where we should be going. Uh, and uh, it's also provided some resources uh, for some of the other regional hospitals. Um, group purchasing, again, you've probably heard this ad nauseum over the last several years. So we are, uh, I meet every month with leadership and materials management at Dartmouth. Um, we have weekly meetings that my staff participate in with the Dartmouth staff, and we leverage standardization of product, uh, group purchasing for capital, um, and we utilize, they actually have a, a lawyers now that we can use within that department um, to better negotiate our contracts and make sure we're protected in any new decisions that we make. And so that's gone very well. I mean, we've, we've done, we do a really good job beating down pricing uh, with some of the vendors, and had a purchase that we did two weeks ago uh, that we beat them down from 350 to 290 and uh, considered that a huge win because it was below market. And uh, Dartmouth stepped in and the, you know, asked them to step in and take a look at the contract and uh, by the time they were done it was down to 250. So uh, we've definitely received benefit of that and uh, we're, we're pretty good about uh, leveraging that relationship and their relationship with the vendors. So that's been a positive for really all the member hospitals in the system. Um, system integration, laboratory, radiology, uh, benefit platform, all these things we've talked about in the past and they're all still true. Uh, last year we uh, adopted the biomed services uh, from Dartmouth and that's been great. Uh, the in individual that we, we have on site is there more often than our prior vendor and uh, is a, actually considered part of our team. Um, and then, as Joe referenced, we still have shared staff, management, and providers that we, uh, we do uh, with government. The captive insurance and shadow captive stop loss. Um, so we are in a, uh, the offshore captive for liability uh, through the uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health System. And uh, additionally, we've set up a program uh, two years ago, which uh, we're in our third year actually now, uh, the shadow captive stop loss. So we're able to raise our attachment point and, and reduce our risk on our health insurance benefits across the system. Uh, that's been very good for us as, as an institution. And uh, we have not only uh, saved some money, in fact, we just got a rebate check two weeks ago, uh, but we've also been able to avoid some of the market pressures of hardening uh, markets. Um, and then uh, we've lowered premium and uh, been able to uh, raise our attachment point. So that's all been positive. Uh, the reconciliation for FY19 going budget to projected. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the key changes uh, accounting for the change from uh, what was approved to where we're coming in. Uh, we've had a, an increase in gross revenue. Uh, and we can talk about that uh, later in a later slide. Uh, but we've had an increase in deductions from revenue, which is really driven by uh, payer mix and uh, the shadow payments in the ACO program. That is offset by uh, FPP, fixed prospective payments, that are uh, booked in other operating revenue, but for purposes of Green Mountain Care Board reporting are moved up uh, into, uh, into uh, the deductions in, in that revenue area. Uh, health reform payments, so that we get from one care that we utilize for care management of patients within primary care. Uh, bad debt free care, uh, actually uh, for 
uh, went down uh, from budget to projected. Uh, we picked up about $40,000 in the final dish calculation, which wasn't available at the time of our submission of budget last year. And then we've just got some little stuff and some rounding. So that gets us from a budget to projected on that patient service revenue. And on the other operating revenue side, um, really we've got a, a great deal of grant income, which Joe has uh, uh, referenced. Uh, we've, we're, we're pretty aggressive, especially when those uh, funds are uh, speak to what we're trying to do with One Care and uh, medical home projects and whatnot. So uh, we've been a little more aggressive with that this year, and we've seen a return on that. Um, and uh, really, we've had a big increase in 340B. And uh, that's, that's something, again, it's, it's good news for all of us um, as far as containing costs and reducing price increase, but it's a little bit scary that we're becoming more and more dependent on uh, something that's not our core business. Uh, expenses, uh, we have a large reclass uh, in adaptive. We were, we were booking it historically, and so we moved that of 1.2 million, so it goes out one and comes back in another. Uh, purchase labor, just as a reminder, one of the questions uh, from staff, which was a good question, was, uh, well, if, you're, if your staffing uh, vacancy is getting lower uh, and you're becoming more of an uh, employer of choice, uh, why was your purchase labor up? And, and what we do every year is, we say, how many uh, travelers did we have for nurses in whatever department? And we estimate their workload in terms of FTEs for the budget. <coughs> but we take that differential between what it would cost to have them as an employee and the cost to have them as a traveler, and we put that amount in purchase labor. And so what happens, uh, earlier in this year, we did have some vacancies uh, back in uh, uh, late fall, early winter, and so we uh, ran over that amount but uh, we, as this year has gone on, we've, we've trimmed that down. And as Joe referenced earlier, we, we have trimmed that down, but not, not only that, we've uh, got a historically low vacancy rate for our employees. Um, we've had an increase in salaries and fringe benefits. Some of those salaries are, are people that we uh, brought in at higher rates uh, than um, we would typically have had them in because of the market pressures that we're experiencing. Some of those are expansion services. The biggest chunk out of that 500,000 is moving to three shifts in respiratory therapy and uh, doing the radiology weekend coverage. Fringe benefits are up. That's kind of actually gotten better the last few months since we submitted our budget. And, uh, um, and so really that's about the only notable things there. And then below the line, uh, we've, we've, this is where we're at with donations and, and the churn of investments and the sale thereof. Um, this is our historical uh, net operating income budget <coughs> actual chart. And uh, so you can see that uh, we're looking to do a 1% in 2020. Uh, and we are, are projecting uh, a loss uh, for this year. Hopefully we'll be able to mitigate that over the next 30 days some clarity and some uh, reserve issues. Uh, this is our cumulative, so you know how are we doing over time? Well, we've kind of flat when we went down with a huge uh, trend of losses uh, from 2007 through uh, really 2012, and then we've kind of stayed flat uh, since then with some very small margins. Um, this is kind of interesting. Um, last year we came and one of our key points was how much our New Hampshire business had grown from the prior year. And, and part of that was our swing bed utilization and uh, being a major uh, referral recipient from Dartmouth for subacute patients of, on both sides of the river. Um, and, uh, and, and there was some other issues going on with some providers in New Hampshire and, and uh, uh, we absorbed that business. So what we did this year was we looked at the same numbers compared to last year. And uh, again, we've seen almost a 4% growth rate uh, in, in New Hampshire in our, in our patient mix of business. Um, most notably, more notably, uh, we looked at two quarters uh, last, uh, last year to this year comparison. And uh, this, we had a 25% increase in patient, uh, patient revenue uh, from service area of Springfield Hospital and a 13% in 
increase uh, in the uh, New Hampshire business. So that's pretty significant, and, and really that's not because we have a super aggressive marketing program. In fact, uh, I'm one probably only CFOs who thinks we should actually spend more money in that area. Uh, it seems I can't go up and down the highway for my job every day without hearing about three other hospitals. Um, but uh, so we're not really aggressively marketing. This is just what's happening organically within the region based on the ebb and flow of available services. Uh, capital budget. So uh, I'll use the word I use every year. We have the least sexy uh, capital budget ever. Um, and uh, so we, we, we're doing about $4.5 million of capital next year. There are no CONs uh, for 2020. We should have already filed for that, and we did. Um, but uh, I will give it the board a heads up that uh, we are uh, trying to figure out a, a, a date to convert to the Dartmouth EMR and their related supporting systems. And so that will be coming up and that will be the CON level discussion. Uh, we're still working through the details of how that would be rolled out and when, but just so you know that that's hanging out there. Um, historically, uh, we have been underfunded by capital. We have made great efforts over the last four or five years to uh, get to a normal rate of replacement to maintain our age of plant. Um, we're really just doing routine replacement. There's really what, not anything that I would consider a strategic project uh, coming. We are always uh, energy efficient, as Joe referenced earlier. Uh, with any new technology that comes in, we're always looking to leverage uh, the latest uh, opportunity with uh, Energy Star. Uh, and uh, our biggest issue internally is bandwidth issues. And that is, do we have enough people to actually get the, the capital in place? And uh, so every year we, we fall short of our capital spend and, and a, a, an amount of money has to roll over into the next year. And then we roll that into the, a certain amount into the following year. Uh, but that really is our, our biggest issue right now is, is getting the, uh, uh, the time and effort available with our lean staff to implement new technology or upgrades. Uh, this is our capital spending by department. Uh, you can see that we're really focused, as we are every year, $1.2 million in facilities, uh, trying to get that aging facility up to speed. Uh, and uh, diagnostic imaging, uh, we have to make uh, ongoing investments in that to stay current. Uh, and information technology, those are really our, our big three departments. And, and, and again, we're talking about routine replacement for most of this. Um, Key capital items, uh, mammography unit, uh, a new generator for the main building, and uh, replacing our telemetry unit, uh, which we actually started this year, but it will not be uh, in, in service until the next fiscal year. Uh, rooftop replacements, super exciting stuff. And, um, but you know, you, if the OR is running too humid or too hot, that's a problem. Uh, so uh, we've done a great, we've got a long-term project that's probably going to run out five more years to uh, update and upgrade all of those to more energy efficient and more effective uh, uh, mechanicals on the roof. So our longer range uh, financial outlook and plans uh, continue to uh, deepen our integration within uh, DHH. We are um, starting uh, next Tuesday, the day after Labor Day, uh, we will be an integral part of the Dharma Hitchcock Health Transfer Center, so we'll be able to redirect patients that are being referred into Dartmouth Hitchcock when they're at capacity. We can bring in our docs and referrals office in real time to help these docs from other hospitals that either can't care for a patient uh, or the family's requesting to get closer to home or w whatever the issue is. Uh, instead of just having Dartmouth Hitchcock and Cheshire Medical Center be the two main hospitals on the transfer center calls, uh, we'll be um, uh, in there as well. And it's a, obviously a smaller slice of acuity that we can manage um, because we don't have an ICU, but uh, we've got a great hospitals program. They're, they want sicker, more complex patients, as do our nurses. Uh, so uh, there'll be more efforts uh, around system capacity like that. Uh, and, of course, regional service line planning. How do we 
you know, right size and coordinate care better in our three hospital, uh, in our three hospitals of uh, Southern Windsor County and Sullivan County in New Hampshire. Uh, we'll continue to um, run lean and, and manage expenses. Um, as I was on a conference call yesterday was with uh, the Dartmouth Hitchcock Health COO, I said, you know, we're, we're, we're still counting paper clips and looking under couch cushions. So uh, we need this formulary plan and PBM plan to, to start um, uh, bearing some fruit for us. Um, we'll continue when able to uh, push our, uh, our, our wages and, and benefits to market levels at, at, at some point. Uh, sooner rather than later, we will move to the Dartmouth Hitchcock Health platform in HR and, and benefits. Um, that was in, uh, a question I think that was asked last year about our self-insured program and not being in, in one care, and that, that continues to be the reason why uh, we're not there. We're, we're on the glide path. It's a shallow one right now, but it is coming. And we'll continue to uh, improve our recruitment and, and retention, although we Again, as our three hospitals work closer together, we're going to have to be more, um, uh, more broadly focused for recruitment and retention for our region as opposed just to Miles County Hospital. Uh, and again, we, we will reduce pricing uh, of, of services to better align with market where we are outliers. A real uh, benefit of, of our one care engagement is we get HSA variation reports, and I review them in detail with. Uh, the folks at, at, at One Care uh, to make sure that we're not falling outside of our predictability. What I can say through the first three to four months in 19, the Windsor HSA is the lowest uh, cost, uh, have the lowest uh, uh, cost for our attributed lives in both Medicaid and Medicare. On the total cost of care, we're, we're, we're the Windsor HSA, we're staying below our historical 3.5% uh, target. Um, however, our limited experience in 2019 and the lag of uh, claims data has really made it difficult, if not impossible, to know where we are financially right now. Dave has not had the ability to run an interim cost report because we don't have clean data. Um, and that, I know, is uh, horrible for Dave um, and, and the rest of our finance team. Uh, it, to be this late in the year and you know planning a soft close in a month and a half and not knowing where we are because of double payments from Medicare, um, uncertainty around the cost report, it is uh, not a place that we like to be in a really in a different spot than we've been the last few years. Um, but some of our strategies to, to control the cost of care, again, continue around care coordination. We've hired another social worker uh, into our clinic to help with complex care management. Uh, we've been working closely with One Care so that we um, not, I wouldn't say provide incentives to use Care Navigator, but to make the use of Care Navigator easier, easier for our providers and our nurses. Um, I'm acutely sensitive to the need for providers and nurses to leave our comprehensive EMR and go into another EMR to document the work that we're doing. There's just not enough bandwidth in the clinic to do that. Um, that said, unlike, unlike Dave, we are throwing a little bit of money at this problem. We're going to hire a community health worker whose job may honestly just be transcription of care planning from our EMR uh, over to Care Navigator, but that's that's what we need to do, especially with new payment models uh, in One Care starting in 2020. And then, as as, as I mentioned before, we're adding three docs in primary care, and uh, I believe that in care management, um, uh, we we will lower costs in the long term with better primary care and keeping folks out of EDs and ICUs. And this slide compliant. <laughs> That's it. We have bonus slides if needed, but we'll leave it at that one. <laughs> Super, thank you. We're going to start uh, the questioning with board member Holmes. Thank you. Um, so first of all, Joe, I want to just applaud your efforts to work with your board to continue working with our team and how hard that must have been, and I appreciate all the efforts of your team and everybody. Um, so I actually want to start, I want to understand a little bit better the relationship actually between Dartmouth Hitchcock and Mount Sputney. What we've seen over the 
my time at the board even the last couple of weeks of hearings is that the hospitals that have some affiliation have some ability to share services, spread fixed costs are doing better. And it sounds like from a lot that you described, the integration uh, or the affiliation has been successful on many levels and there's continued work to be done with moving HR and those sorts of things. But let me just ask you, I, I noted in the narrative the uh, emphasis by Dartmouth-Hitchcock to help you, the importance that you reach a 1% margin. And I want to understand better how Dartmouth-Hitchcock is helping you do that besides some of the cost savings. So for example, you talked about 1,458 post-acute uh, you know, referrals from Dartmouth and the 5,100 referrals from Dartmouth overall. Can you tell me if those referrals are high margin referrals, low margin referrals? I mean, are, those, are these referrals actually helping your bottom line, keeping it the same, or actually yeah. uh, So Dave and I will tag team on this one. I, it's, a, it's a mix. Um, our acute rehabilitation referrals are, are, are higher margin referrals for us. Swing, not so much. Uh, we, and we also have a third track, and these are the folks that are languishing in DH without a payer, without a disposition plan, that we agree to take down to free up a tertiary care bed in Lebanon, and Dave has worked on um, a, a, a daily rate that we then just build our uh, Hitchcock directly for, the system directly for, to reimburse us for that care. And that is a rate, you know, between Swing and Medicaid reimbursement, I would say, but Dave can give a, probably a sharper answer there. Yeah, so the, the rate is between uh, a nursing home rate and a SNF rate, and uh, um, I, I wanted to be overly detailed with Dartmouth and bill them according to the level of care that the patient was receiving, and they said, no, just take the two, blend them together, and that's what we're going to pay. So a few years ago, we came here, and this was kind of, kind of evolving, and so we had talked about a system allocation payment of approximately $1.2 million. It went below the line as we, again, were trying to figure out where services were going to go within not only the system but the region. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we, we, we signed up for that. And, uh, um, and, and so the first year was kind of like, okay, this, we're going to pay you and it's going to cover these patients and we'll figure it out. But what's happened is we've gotten pretty good at uh, what we call outstationing or getting people uh, coverage, whether it's through the Medicaid program or the exchange or whatnot. And so we've been able to get people covered. Uh, and uh, so anybody who's not covered and comes from Dartmouth, uh, we still bill them for that rate that, as Joe referenced. Um, and, and so now we're seeing a little bit of a change in, in the mix of patients we're getting because we're actually getting some acute to acute transfers from Dartmouth now which, you know, again, we're very high Medicare and, and substantial Medicaid, so let's just say 60% of our business is uh, paid at a low cost, technically. And so, uh, you know, I don't know that we have a lot of margin business, period. Um, yeah, and uh, we have a, a very slow OR, so we're not getting a lot of that. So, you know, we're really looking, uh, you know, and I, I don't think that a 1% expectation from Dartmouth is, is unreasonable on, oper, uh, on operations. I think that somewhere in the vicinity of two, two and a half is what a CAA should be able to pull off. Uh, but again, we're still working through these allocations of services within the region. And uh, I think we've gotten better and we're not receiving that subsidy anymore. And we've learned to kind of make things work. Um, and, uh, and so we, we're hopeful that that will continue. Thank you, that's helpful. As a follow-up to that, you mentioned uh, in the narrative and, and briefly here that you beat the financial targets for domestic care, care we at your hospital for Louisiana, <coughs> but where you owed money was in the non-domestic care. And I'm imagining a lot of that non-domestic care is actually occurring in dartmouth Uh but maybe not all of it. But you specifically referenced the, um, the, uh, the family practice that's sending a lot of their patients to dartmouth Hitchcock, and that was potentially problematic for you. So I guess I'm also wondering what that backstop looks like. If you're doing well managing the care that you can control, but some of the care is going throughout the Hitchcock and you're still trying to make your bottom line. So can you help me figure that out? Well, if I, if I could, um, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'd, I'd be on the road consulting somewhere uh, or teaching. Uh, but that's, I think, you know, we had a, a reference in the slides about, you know, I call threading the needle of getting 1% for Dartmouth 
staying within the growth rates of the Green Mountain Care Board, putting up a margin for uh, our, our board expects us to be able to stand on our own and, and to uh, uh, build our balance sheet, and, and then looking at the one care. And, and so uh, that's, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible. I think we, we came pretty close this year. I think we, we did a pretty good job on that. But to your point, uh, once somebody leaves the friendly confines of Mount Escutney, uh, whether, uh, especially if it's a Medicare or Medicaid uh, ACO patient, tribute to life, I mean, we really, the patient that Joe referenced is down in Boston for 10 days. Yeah. I literally. That, I mean, I, to some degree, that's truly non domestic care. I look at care at Dartmouth Hitchcock coming out of a Mount Escutney <laughs> hospital is not quite non domestic care to the extent that you're affiliated with Dartmouth Hitchcock. So, I, I don't know how that all works with the backstopping. I get the Boston patient completely out of your control. Well, you but but that, they're going to a place that this, this, is, this is their rate structure, this is their, their yeah. tertiary care uh, you know, protocol, this is what that patient needs it. And, and so we really, there's really not much even Dartmouth can do. They can just render the care and no, but I guess one of the backstop is to help Mount Scutney from Dartmouth Hitchcock for that care that's being received. So I'll an, maybe I'll try answering it this way. So essentially, uh, the system, all member hospitals in, in, in Dartmouth, you know, we have a consolidated balance sheet. We have a, functionally a consolidated P&L. Everything's consolidated. By definition, we're backstops. Uh, we no longer need uh, our own credit rating, not that small hospitals necessarily have one. Uh, but we're not reviewed in the credit market. Uh, our lending is done uh, uh, as part of Dartmouth's financing uh, planning. And so, uh, you know, if we have the cash at the end of the day that we would have for a mar you know, margin because there was actually a net asset transfer, then, then that's, that's what we have. We have the position, the financial position to still invest in capital and, and do the things we need to do regardless of how the p and looks. Very helpful, thank you. Um, I was encouraged to see that slide 16 that had the regional planning with the three critical access hospitals because we recognize there's three critical access hospitals within 20 minutes of each other. And so I'm very encouraged to hear that uh, the three presidents, CEOs, or leaders of that, those organizations are getting together to figure out care delivery optimization in your region. And I'm hoping that duplicative services will be reduced and other things. And I don't know if you could just talk a little about how optimistic you are that this is actually going to materialize in the next 12 to 18 months, some sort of regionalization of service delivery. Sure. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think we have 12 to 18 months. I think that's that's too long of a timeline. Um, so so there's, some, <laughs> there's, there's time pressure to get something moving. You all, we also have two of the three hospitals have CEOs that are either interim or, or hired management firm. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure are looking for a significantly extended time uh, in those roles. In fact, the Valley Regional CD, uh, interim CEO was one of our board members. So, uh, and uh, so I am cautiously optimistic. Um, uh, Dave is on the working group as well uh, to uh, provide a financial voice. We are getting outside help as well. Dartmouth Fishcock uh, Health is uh, also at the table and helping us work through this, because this, this is a tough problem. And eventually we will get to the difficult decisions of who does what and where, and that's, that's any system coming together. Um, I've counseled folks in the same way that uh, we shepherded ourselves through the Dartmouth Fishcock affiliation, is you, each institution has to look inward and, and then and, and to determine who they think they are. And then, uh, then we kind of all have to agree that coming together, this is who, who we think we're going to be. And really, the the, the one issue that um, is uh, you know sacred is every every community must have robust and vibrant primary care and good local options for primary care. But beyond that, frankly, I think I, I think everything should should be on on the table. We have limited resources or a limited number of surgeons and specialists who can provide the care. Now, if that means we have to um, come up with significant transportation solutions to help people move between communities, it's not like we are 
dealing with communities of Weston, Wellesley, and you know some other and, and Natick. I mean, we're our our folks have a heavy payer mix of Medicare and Medicaid, and we need to make sure we we serve them. And uh, transportation between communities can be onerous for them. Um, so so we have to we, we've got a lot of irons in the fire. Um, we have a commitment from all three organizations to, to make this work. I wish we had 12 to 18 months, um, uh, but we don't, and so we're going to have to come come up quicker. Well, this is a conversation that should have been happening. I'm glad it's happening. <coughs> yeah, and, and I'm comfortable saying that we have been working um, closely with Valley Region for at least the last uh, year plus. In fact, even a few years ago, looked at bringing our organizations closer together. It just didn't make sense at the time. Um, but uh, Springfield's issues, you know, <coughs> jump to the head of the line sometimes. I think Dave has come. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things that I've experienced over 30 years in healthcare is we have a lot of these discussions, you know, they, they kind of cycle through and nobody's willing to give up anything at the end of the day and nobody's willing to take the lead. This situation is a little bit different because we have a, a, a two hospitals that, that are not in a good place and uh, so I think the dynamics of this discussion are a little bit more reasonable. I know Joe's very reasonable. Believe it or not, I'm actually very reasonable. And we are looking at shuffling things to the best possible place regardless of, because we're looking at it as total expense, total cost, total margin. We're looking at it from that perspective. What, what, let's make sure care doesn't leave the region. Just, it just might be in a different building. And I think the other nuance that I think is helpful in the situation is that Dartmouth is actually looking at what things they could solve with their operations by utilizing the capacity in, in these three smaller places uh, appropriately clinically. And, and so that's a dynamic that I don't think typically happens in these regional discussions where somebody else is saying, hey, we actually may be able to push some other services out that currently we keep inside, but we're, we're compressed. So it's a win-win, and, and I think that's one of the nuances that's going to uh, hopefully make this thing work. Well, I applaud the efforts. It sounds like everybody's at the table. Uh, I look forward to hearing about it. So let me, can we talk about your NPR? So the NPR, uh, request is 7.4% budget to budget, 6.5% over projected. So whenever things are 6.5% over, or anything higher than say 3.5% over projected, we worry about aspirational budget. Um, and then the expenses being, as Maureen will probably talk about, so I don't want to spend too much time telling what Maureen's going to go through. But I want to ask you about if you can give us a little bit more breakdown of where this is coming from. Um, so I recognize some of it may be coming from Springfield. So this is NPR that exists already in the system that's basically being transferred. If you could help us carve out a little, I saw the 25%, I think, was that right in the slide. But some of it may be coming from New Hampshire, it sounds like, some of the patients. Are these new patients, you know, some of the other hospitals have given us unique patient uh, data to show that actually it's a new volume coming in, new, new patients coming in. Um, is it coming from the three providers, uh, primary care providers that you've added? I mean, I, I, help us to understand a little bit about sure. where this volume is coming from because I, I get pieces of the story, but I'm not really getting the full story here. And it's, it's a big leap, mm -hmm. especially since it's a big leap over where you are even projected to be in 19. Understood. So this, this uh, um, chart that we actually provided uh, last year after our hearing because we had a similar but smaller discussion. Um, and uh, this seemed to be well accepted, so we went back to this uh, after we, uh, when we submitted our budget to see, okay, does this pass the straight face test for us? And so uh, looking at the change from budget to budget, that's what we're talking about here, um, we, we have a, a net patient service revenue uh, increase of 3.8 million year to year. And uh, so that's a 7.4% increase year to year. Uh, and so 3.5% is what we were allowed. So if you take that off, we get down to 2 million. Out of that remaining 2 million, 525,000 uh, was, is, is, New Ham is associated with folks coming from New Hampshire. Now, whether that's a referral from Dartmouth, 
uh, because it, it, it's, uh, the services aren't available, um, uh, or uh, something going on at Valley Regional. I mean, Joe can speak to those service lines uh, better than I can, uh, but that's the increase that we're seeing based on current trend. And then uh, other auto stages kind of negligible, it's leaf peepers, right? So, uh, and uh, skiers. And then we've, we've got 282,000 uh, at the time of budget that we ex that we had seen moving from the Springfield HSA to ours. And so uh, that brings us down to about uh, $1.2 million growth. And really the other $1.2 million is what we're um, essentially using, you know, to guard against these some of these ACO issues we're still working through. And Joe and I have talked, I mean, we talked at nauseum about this, I mean, it's it, we talk about this literally every other day, and and one of the things that uh, we decided upon when we submitted our budget, so uh, July first, was if we're able to uh, um, clean up some of these things with the ACO and get to good clean numbers where we can really understand where we are, and we can alleviate the cost report pressure that we're fe feeling currently, we would be happy to revise our our um, price increase and the, the gross net revenue and deductions to to remove uh, that million dollars, which is really the bogey we're looking at. And if you look at the 1.2 million dollars, again, we're going net patient service revenue, net patient service revenue. 600,000 is our one percent margin, right? So, um, so we're really at the end of the day, looking at $500,000 that we're associating with the ACO risk at this point based on our current understanding and resources. Can I follow up on that question? Yeah, you can. So, if you go back to the slide that uh, showed the Q3 to Q3. Did you say two, three? Q3? Q3, quarter three comparison. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. There you go. But it, in your answer to Jess, she was basically pinpointing the fact that um, what your projections are for the end of this year. And I'm assuming that this Q3 shift, the 25% from Springfield, 13% from New Hampshire, is already being seen in the projections. So I'm curious, obviously you might not have seen much earlier in this budget year from Springfield, but what has been the shift from New Hampshire in the initial quarters of the existing year, like Q1 and Q2 from New Hampshire, and what makes you think it's gonna shift even more? Uh, because this is really a three-year trend for the New Hampshire. The Springfield's a new issue, right? But um, the New a Hampshire- A steady trend that, the steady growth? Yes, and that's what we spent time on last year as well is uh, that New Hampshire, we, when we ran all our data, we said, well, what's going on here? And then we decided to do a study by zip code, patient address zip code, and that's where we found that New Hampshire was burgeoning in our shop. And uh, so we did this as part of upfront. We actually ran this uh, um, uh, early in the budget process to make sure that we could see what was going on and how that was changing from year to year. And what you can see from this slide is Going year to year, the change is 13% positive for New Hampshire. In other words, we have 13% more New Hampshire business measured in that quarter versus the prior quarter, which is what we used to submit our budget last year. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm assuming that most of that is probably in the rehab, right? Um, no, it's, no. It's, it's primary care, it's swing bed, it's rehab. It, it's it's uh, We don't have a lot of surgical business, but some of our surgical practices, we're mm -hmm. seeing it. Uh, and some of our ancillary services. And is there sufficient capacity left to meet a continued trend like that? Uh, yeah, actually there is, and, and we looked at that when we developed our FTE model for the upcoming year, <coughs> looking at what we're running at now. So one of the discussions we had, um, I don't know if it was last year's budget hearing or maybe the reimbursement uh, presentation that Joe and I did, we talked about the percentage of fixed cost that a critical access hospital uh, has, which is you know arguably 75, 80 percent, um, 
you know, you, you have to have somebody in that seat 24 hours a day, whether anybody comes in or not. You can't have less than one person. And so there are a number of departments that in, in taking this business in, we're just filling up what's the existing capacity better. Okay. Yes, sir. No, 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 that's okay. Can you just go back to the justification slide? I'm just going to be honest. I don't quite understand the 1.2 bucket that hasn't been, that's just sort of out there. Other. This one? Yeah, that, that one. I'm still not clear what that is. Uh, that's basically everything that is not above and what we needed to put a 1% margin down. We needed that much net patient service revenue growth to get to the 1% margin. So it's not driven by volume, it's not driven by acuity, it's not driven by patient, new patients coming in, it's no. just aspirational hopes that if you get that, you'll make your money. Well, it's not aspirational. Uh, but it's not, it's not tied to anything that you... Say, we well, it's, it's tied to, so when we budget, we say, okay, what do we need to do for a budget? Dartmouth says we'd like to have 1%, our board says 2%, you guys say you're limited with net patient service revenue growth, and you know, so we, and we got one care cost uh, goals, so we say, okay, we're going to try to get to the 1%, that's our goal. And so we figure out how busy we're going to be. We take... Uh, um, the necessary expenses, FTEs, paper clips, whatever, and we determine how much it costs in stuff and people to deliver that volume. And then we look at our contractual rates, our reimbursement rates historically, and we back into the necessary price increase to get us to that 1% margin with the infrastructure that we need to deliver those services. And so that's, that's, that's how we, we that's how, that's how we're doing it. So in order to cover um, the uh, risk that we perceive in the ACO and to put a 1% margin, that's kind of what we're talking about for the 1.2 million. But we, we always start with the end in mind and work backwards. And the last thing we put into our model is the price increase, which does have an effect on um, that patient service revenue. Sure. Um, so I would, I would add, just as just quickly, so Again, three new primary care docs. That's just we're, ask, where is that? We're, in? We're, um, uh, I'd say it's in the 1.2. I mean, it, these are these are folks whom are going to who are going to build their practice over the next year. No, no new doc comes on um, and sees 15, 16 patients in a day. We're all um, walk, orienting them slowly into our clinics. Um, there are ongoing discussions at the system level around other service lines um, that again are driven by community need. And also capacity needs at Dharma Fishcock Health. You know, their their operating rooms are burgeoning. For example, do they need to send surgeons to cases uh, so that they can serve their their patients better? Because we have capacity in our in our OR. So I, I think that there's the potential um, uh, for revenue growth there. But the, the discussions are are truly embryonic at at this point. So not anything that we're comfortable uh, budgeting for at this time. Sometimes. We receive new services and providers from DH very quickly. Other times, it can take a year or so of planning to to arrange for a day of week, a day a week of a of a specialist. Um, uh, you know, I, I as I mentioned earlier, that we have at least a thousand to maybe fifteen hundred patients that we need to bring back into our system that, that have been kind of waiting out in the out in the weeds um, until we had new primary care docs. So the, the that in, infusion. Uh, I think will help us substantially. I guess I would say that when, maybe next year when you're presenting, it helps us, I think, to think about where is the growth coming from. And if you can partition it from volume, separating it from price. And we recognize that price increase is going to have a contribution to NPR. But where is the volume coming from? It sounds like some of it's coming from Springfield. It sounds like some of it's coming from New Hampshire. Some of it may be coming from patients that have not been you know, seeing a primary care provider now will, that would be a helpful way for us to think about it in the future. So I don't want to beat a horse on that, but, um, but more you might go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, a couple, one, well, actually, a quick question about this. There's a big jump in Medicaid in particular um, in the projections. Can you just talk a little bit about that? It was, it was part of a big shift your projections, Medicaid patients, Medicaid revenue? Uh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, net patient revenue. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a little bit in there, you know, a couple tens of thousands that are associated with the uh, Medicare increase uh, that uh, we were afforded July 1st. And, um, and then there uh, also was some increase in the uh, patient population that we were seeing. I think part of the other thing is we're trying to get to these chronic care patients and uh, some of these folks in the ACO and trying to get them in and we're seeing the effect of that in our projected this year. We expect that to continue and possibly grow more preventative care versus uh, okay. episodic. I might be wrong, I'll have to check this, but I think on my notes I have, you have projected to come at 1.9 million for 2019, you made budget 4 million for 2020, is that right? I'll be happy to look at that so offline. That, that's like a doubling. And your gross actually is not going up for that. It's your contractual allowances on this on one of the spreadsheets that shows change. Um, I think that the staff prepares. I'd be happy to take a look at that offline when I have some. That's fine. Stuff just, it was a big jump, and I I would love to understand it as it relates to some of the things there. Okay. Yeah, I will add that you know one of one of my goals in twenty is to deepen the relationship between. Mount County Hospital and Health Center and White River Family Practice, since all those attributed to Medicare and Medicaid lives are we're, we're on the hook for the for the downside risk there. Um, so a lot of our, um, our our current Medicaid attributed lives are coming from them. So we, we, we need to find a way to better serve them, um, and that may be work around the ancillaries and, and, and such. I don't think it's enough to double uh, what we expect. So we need to do a deeper dive on that. That would be helpful. Yep. I just want to make sure, in the narrative, there was reference to cost report uncertainty and a loss of a million dollars due to not counting attributed lives that you then had to recognize in the 2020 budget. Um, can you speak to this? Because I thought my understanding was that you can, in the cost report now, I think there's more understanding about how to do the Medicare cost reports with how we count attributed lives. I'm not an expert on this, but could you speak to that a little bit and how I think that some of that information has come out recently before your budget was, after your budget was submitted and how that impacts your budget. So uh, a couple things. Um, so uh, way back early this spring, um, we, went, we went over and visited with Porter and talked, because they were in the process of settling out 2018 for Medicare and uh, Jen Bertrand and her folks, you know, great people. We, we went through, what are you doing? <coughs> And in the discussion there, she says, well, how do you think this should be filed? And I said, based on my understanding of regs, that these uh, attributed lives should be handled in the cost report like a Medicare Part C patient, where they're considered uh, in the calculation of cost per day or cost per charge ratio for outpatient services, uh, but they are not included in the settlement process. And, and so, she, she, that, that's where we landed. So I say, great, great minds, you know. Um, and so when they filed their cost report, uh, Barry Dunn, their, their firm that they used, um, agreed with that. And so they filed it that way. And then when we started doing it as part of our budget process, um, there were two aspects of it. One, there was no clear um, reg that spoke to this. And the only example that we could compare it to would be Part C people. So um, I went out and talked to uh, our firm, as well as two national firms uh, who've seen stuff all over the country. And the consensus was they should be carved out. So, you know, and these were questions that we've, I've been asking for four years. Like, is there a clarity? Can we get some a position on this? Um, so, as I tell, as I told our board members, we labored through this discussion. I can file my, my taxes at the end of the year and tell the IRS I'm entitled to a million dollars coming back, uh, but that doesn't mean I filed my my taxes correctly or that they're going to actually pay me a million dollars. So uh, as we, we we try to pull this together as part of our normal budget process through an interim cost report, we realize that uh, the PSNR. Uh, which is uh, basically a reimbursement report where Medicare shows they paid on what patient for what service um, during a given period. Um, there was, uh, the, the shadow payments were not reflected uh, for the first quarter. Uh, we found out that they were paying us fee for service 
uh, when they should we should have been getting that in the fixed payments or we're getting it in both. Uh, so we really couldn't even estimate Medicare side of the settlement process. So we went back into the cost report, started talking to everybody, and uh, determined again that there is there is no clear direction on how to file this. Now everybody wants us to be able to include that cost in the settlement. Uh, we do, Care does, CMMI thinks that it should be included. Uh, the, there was an email that came out approximately a month ago, I believe, that said, yeah, you should be able to do that, basically, I'm paraphrasing. And, and so I went back and said, great, show me where that is, because the only thing that matters to me is regs. Y you know, because uh, that thing's not gonna be audited for three years. And so I need to be able to go back and say, I was directed that this is how this is to be filed. And uh, to date, CMS says, yes, you should be able to, but I still don't have a document. And the people who I really trust in the industry are saying no. So I, I'm, uh, I have an aspiration uh, that uh, this will all be resolved and we will get a clean PSNR and be able to generate a cost report with regs that support our action and that million dollar issue, which again is an estimate, we don't even, we, we really couldn't even get to a really solid number like we usually can. I can get to the penny on this thing normally, but I, I can't, you know, well, this is our best guess. Does that help? Is it not help? Well, it does. The CMS and CMI are right that you can bring them in. How would it affect your 2020 budget? Well, as I referenced earlier, I, that million dollars or most of it would go away. That discussion and that would, that would come with me going all the way back to the uh, rate increase right. and reducing that, so uh, reducing what we would be leveraging the commercial payers for generally, right? And so we would uh, uh, make most of that go away. And we've been talking about, we're totally open to doing that, uh, but uh, based on everything that we have for documentation, I, I, I would never get through audit uh, taking a different position. Uh, thank you, helpful. I guess my last question that I've asked every hospital, but I think I have the answer to you for you is, um, the, you know, the HDA question was the ratio of commercial to Medicare. You reported that it was 1.3. So can I assume then that if on average Medicare pays $100 for a service, your commercial payers on average reimburse $130? Is that the correct yeah. way to interpret that? Okay. Thank you. So. Thank you. Doreen. First, great questions, Jess. So I had a bunch of those that were similar. Um, I do want to spend a bit of time on the net patient revenue and really kind of going back from the past three years and just kind of understanding some of the one-time things that go on. And first, I want to say I totally appreciate that there's a lot of new things happening and you know, with the ACL and with double payments and things like that. And so, you know, I think it's very challenging. So I'm trying to just for myself really go back through and understand which years were impacted, <coughs> what any changes would be. So I know I think the first one was 2018, which um, if you go back to I think one slide to your budget compliance slide, um, actually on your NPR you were quite quite high, you came in at 4.4% above, right, for uh, NPR. So, um, but part of that year, you talked about double payments, I believe, um, at the time. I just want to understand, did those double payments from Medicare get registered, and then later on you're giving them back? I mean, I understand it's kind of a year-over-year -year piece, but I guess the first question is, is in 2018, do you think there are any one-time things that maybe artificially inflated your NPR, which we're then adjusting for in 19 or 20? Uh, off the top of my head, I would say no. We didn't have double payments in 18. We've had that phenomenon in 2019 since we joined the Medicare program okay. uh, for the ACO. But off the, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Teresa. Uh, I don't remember any any one, one hit wonder from 2018, that, uh, but I'm happy to go back and take a look at it. And then uh, the other thing you did talk about is the swing bed piece, which I think you said rec was reconciling like for three years, like 17, 18, and 19. And were there any one-time impacts of that in 19 adjusting for the prior years then? Uh, there's been incremental. Uh, we did uh, figure out a way to mitigate the effect of that. In, uh, 
the net hit that we're taking is built into the 2020 budget, and uh, we're accruing for it as this year goes along. So why would the net hit be 2020 instead of 2019 if we know about it now? Yeah, we're, we're accruing for it this year as we go along. Okay. So, so it's, it's in both. It's in both years. But we haven't realized the full amount because we haven't finished this year yet. Okay. Um, and then going to your reconciliation that you had for um, the NPR justification, um, so the challenge there is you also provided a bridge, which, which we don't have up here, um, which I understand here you're saying, okay, we get the three and a half percent, and then we have this extra number down here. And, and when you did your bridge chart for, um, for this, you took the 51,195, which was your starting point for 19, and you went to the 55, and you actually had the commercial rate is 1376, so that's pretty clear, and that's part of it that would be additive. The utilization was 4.8 million, which is up 9%. Um, and then some of the offsets to that are other ACO reserves, which is about $2 million, 1975, which is 4%. So the challenge here is really understanding what that 9% utilization change is. You're, you're showing about the 828 you know, million dollars of it, but the change you put here is 4.8 million. Um, and so there's an additional four million. So just the fact of saying I get to go to three and a half percent as a target, and then I have these other issues, I think you know there's still a struggle to get to what's building up that additional utilization, what's building up that four point eight. And I also will say that's against budget and against projection. It could be different, but your budget and projection are pretty close. Um, in this case, you know you're coming in. Uh, pretty close to your budget for the year. So it may have to be a follow-up, but can you, t or can you talk to what that 9% utilization change is from budget? Well, I think a lot of it is reflected in the volume numbers that you, that for projected 2019, you can see where, where some of that is. And it, that, that's part of that jump. The other part of it is some of these things that we're experiencing right now during uh, 2019, the growth from the Springfield service area, the growth from the New Hampshire service area, uh, uh, the growth of acuity within our organization. And I'm happy, to be honest with you, we, we really struggle with the Bridges, um, the, the Bridges presentation. Um, we don't think like that. Um, that's not how we, we, we cut um, and, and divide up business. And so, uh, I know we, we struggled with it last year. It was less of a struggle this year. Um, and, and, but I'm happy to go back and, and do whatever is, is needed on there to make it more clear. Because this, this slide that's up on the screen now clearly doesn't cut the way the bridge cuts. No, and I, I think even if you take a projection, your projection is 51,639, and you're going to 55,007. Um, in both of those years, you have a reserve for the ACO, so the net change of those is about a 700,000 increase year over year. So, I mean, that, that to me is an additional um, NPR before you get to the reserves, because you, you very well could hit the numbers exactly dead on, right? And then you're projecting in 2020, about a $2 million reserve for the ACL for 100% of the downside risk. But could go the other way, right? You could get $2 million favorable. And separate to that, I always have had a little bit of an issue of this affecting NPR because your underlying gross business is going up higher and then this, this change for the reserve is, has nothing to do with underlying utilization right now. It just has to do really what you'll have to pay for those patients who might be receiving their care outside of your area and the rest. So you absolutely have the rest, I'm not saying that. But you actually have a higher year-over-year -year change in your NPR when you adjust for just the impact of your reserves. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that, you know, and Joe and I have talked to nauseam about is 
We're taking the most prudent accounting position that we can right now based on the available information. And so we've gone back and forth with our uh, auditing firm we had about um, a few weeks ago to kind of go over these reserves. Because in theory, I would agree that we're over-reserving. Yeah. But uh, the, the key standard is, is it probable and is it estimatable? And right now for us, neither of those can be accomplished. And so again, as some of these issues are cleaned up, then I've, I'm happy to go back and revisit. And I think that if we'd like to all separate that risk from uh, you know, the net patient growth discussion, but you can't, they're, 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 they're dovetailed. And so, um, and it, it, was very, it was very arduous to, to go through this process and come up with what we thought we could stand on. And, um, and, and you know, I, I'm happy. If we have to revise it, I'm not happy. But I'm willing, I'm willing to do additional budget work, even if it were, you know, whatever, the middle of October, if we're still languishing in some of these issues. Uh, I'm happy to do that. And, and again, Joe knows this, and, and folks who've been here a while, I don't come in with made-up numbers. This is as close to made-up numbers as I've ever presented anything here, ever, all the way back to Bishka days, you know, uh, because we're so uncertain. We can't even, our own internal modeling, we can't get to the number. This is the first time in literally 20 years that at this point in the year, I have no idea how I'm gonna really finish. And I think, you know, and you're highlighting, you know, one of the big challenges with the reserves, and I know we're all learning in this, and it's interesting because, you know, the hospitals are running the spectrum of how they're accounting for that. I would say you're on the most conservative side, which is mm -hmm. budgeting 100% each year because the chance of a risk of losing all three payers 100%, you know, to the downside two years in a row is probably fairly significant. And I understand what you're saying with probable and estimatable, but when you're given the estimate from the ACO, if, if you believe there's a 50% you could be down and a 50% you could be up, then the probable and estimatable year over year is not the downside 100%. And what we're seeing with some of the hospitals now is you book the 100% the first year because who the heck knows what's gonna happen. And then when you get to the second year, they're adjusting to kind of say, okay, I'm gonna book some said 75% of the total, some said 55%, 50 50% of the total, some have said, you know, none because they're going to backstop. And, 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 you know, you guys did talk a little bit about a backstop from Dartmouth, which, you know, many of the other hospitals don't have. But if there's such a backstop, then, you know, and as we learn, sometime in 2020, we'll have a resolution for what happened in 19, um, you know, at least directionally what's going on with 19 and then 20 will still be out there. So I don't know what the right answer is for sure, and I understand what you're saying, your auditors are saying. I've also dealt with a lot of auditors, and you can talk to them about things and say, okay. look, we did 100% this year, we're not gonna do 100% second year. So, but, so, and I agree, I don't disagree with anything you just said at all, but I, uh, we, had, we did not even have a 2019 budget uh, when we came here last year. For, and we kind of, we signed up in good faith, right? And uh, so we're, we don't have a history. Our history started January 1st, and our history started with double payments. Right. And, and so it's, it is literally impossible for us to parse this data out to a, in, in a way that we feel comfortable. Forget about the auditors. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we have no history. Uh, we've spent so much time working on this that we really haven't even had a chance to go back and look at the baseline data for the model that estimated the risk from one care Vermont. It's fine as far as I know, but I don't know if that was people were just healthy that year or those 3,000 attributed lives were healthy in the base year compared to normal years. I have no idea. So um, we have taken a very conservative position. I would be happy to back off that position and for the good of everybody. Um, but we just really didn't feel like we could do that. But, you know, we did this, uh, our budget had to be done uh, for, for us by June 5th in order to meet the Dartmouth guidelines. Uh, 
uh, submission guidelines so we can get their approval to send the budget here July 1st. And uh, in doing so, um, you know, we really only had three months of data and we hadn't even experienced the full lag of the Medicare and Medicaid claims coming through the One Care system yet, which is nobody's fault, that's just the timing of the data. Um, so, I mean, we really went into this thing fairly blind. And, and the magnitude for, for your hospital is so significant that that one nine, the $2 million that you're reserving for the ACO risk in 2020 is about 3.5%. And so therefore, when you're targeting a 1% operating margin, three and a half in that, and then there's another million potentially within the you know, <coughs> issue you may resolve with, with Medicare as well. I mean, it's pretty big sprint swing items. And then looking at it's not obviously a one for one, but looking at your commercial rate ask of you know, 1.3 million in total, 1.4, you know, that's, if some of these other things were dropping to the bottom line, absolutely, you'd be able to decide which lever do you pull, and that may be a lever you don't need to pull. And so it's, it's a challenge for us, as well as the other piece of it is, are you even gonna get to this NPR to begin with? And, and you know, on a really a 9% utilization change, once you adjust for all these one-time things that are in there, it's pretty significant, and if you don't hit that, then you're not going to hit your bottom line either. So, I mean, um, it's a struggle we're going through as well, and I, I don't know what the answer, but I, I do think there will be some follow-ups about, you know, how do we look at it, you know, through, totally through the next Yeah, and, and I want to reiterate that we are you know, fully committed to as much revision as necessary, uh, and certainly there'll be downward uh, pressure on, on MPSR and our rate increase. Um, uh, as we answer these questions, as we get more firm answers around, again, the, the cost report, and I remain optimistic that's going to be sorted out. And as we um, put more, uh, put a little more thought to what our being in a larger health system means around downside risk, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how any critical access hospital could go into the Medicare program if they weren't part of a larger health system with deeper pockets. I, re I, I really think it's a struggle. When you just you look at your budget and you say, yeah, it's unlikely that we're going to uh, max out our downside risk, but if we, if we went halfway there, if we went at 1.1 million, point, that, that's, you know, that, that's the margin. Um, and our, our board really struggled. Uh, with that, we still do have an independent board with uh, that has some DH appointees on it. But even the DH appointees, we're very concerned about their responsibilities. Um, you know, I, I think we've we've leveraged as much as we can uh, at CMS, CMMI, Greenmont Care Board, One Care, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health Leadership to to, um, to convince both our senior leadership team and our board that this is the right thing to do. And as a physician, again, as a you know an internist. This is the right model, and it's the right thing to do. Um, but if booking downside risk impairs our ability to give a market raise to our housekeepers, um, that, that's a real balancing act. That's, that's kind of the, the, the boots on the ground. What does this mean to the, to the institution? What's a rounding error for a larger place is, you know, is, is comp at the, uh, at the hospital. Unfortunately, I think, you know, this year, we'll, we'll, I don't know how we'll all handle this, you know, but next year, you know, you'll know what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, if, if all this were to ride through this year, for example, and we just said, okay, let's, let's let it roll, yeah. let's see what happens. Then next year, you know, should there be an understanding of a settlement for 19 and, and not needing them to book it, you know, the expectation would be, yeah. you know, how, how can we potentially give some of that back? Yeah, I, I, I think um, like as we grow our experience I, at, at this time next year, um, I know that I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that the Green Mountain Care Board gives reserve guidance, risk reserve guidance, and that uh, in the same sense that we get our NPSR growth guidance, we'll, we'll have the experience to actually make, now the problem is we'll have the experience of only a, a couple real critical, a couple of critical access hospitals that are part of a larger system. So it's gonna be easier for us to go, oh yeah, sure, we, we can do that. I think it's still going to be a, a struggle for the smaller hospitals to, 
and jump in. And you know, to be honest, it's 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 hard for each hospital to do it individually, and you know, for us to try to give that reserve guidance on top of what your auditors are going to also be telling you and instructing you to do is a challenge as well. So, I, I but it's something we, we're definitely looking at. Too. Yeah, I, I think I think we need to uh, just find a band of reasonableness when the dust settles. Uh, that we can all live with, and, and I think that's really, really where we need to go. But at the end of the day, in order for this healthcare reform uh, program to work, it, it needs to be doable for every hospital on, on its own. Yes. And, and really, the system discussion, while we support that, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, any hospital participating in this should have a fair and reasonable chance to at least break even on this thing, right? So. Um, you know, the, the system allocation payments and things like that, to me, fly a little bit in the face of, this should just be a good program and should work clinically and financially and otherwise, you know, from regulatory. That's where we should all be shooting. And again, we're all figuring it out as we go along. Uh, there's really, uh, the, the experience for critical access hospitals is Springfield, who had a difficult year regardless of the last year, um, and Porter, who's had filed one thing, but they're now refiling their cost report because of these issues, and us, and we've, you know, we've been at six minutes. So um, it's, it, it's, it's a really awkward, it's like I'm 13 again. I, you know, I'm really <laughs> if I could just jump in just for a quick yeah, second. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I, I think that we are all learning. I think the hospitals are learning. I think the ACO is learning. I think the board is learning how we deal with all of this. And I think that there's even some uh, reimagining happening at the ACO level yep. of how do you apportion that risk. Yep. And so I think we're going to learn a lot more. And so we all need to be patient with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm all set, thanks. So Jess, well, no, Jess covered my other questions <laughs> about, about swing beds and cost and things like that. So thank you. Good, Tom. Well, it seems that we have three board members that were thinking alike that probably could have designated one of us to ask these questions. I, uh, I too, look forward to clarification. I, I can look at um, this document that's, that's on the screen and see that, you know, that uh, the two line items allow 3.5% uh, NPSR growth and the other NPSR growth add up to 2.98 million, which is 78% of the, the delta in between the year. Um, but it's really not any specif that well specified. So when I go to bridges to see how things move, you know, I can see the kind of the, the kind of uh, weeds <laughs> that we're all kind of struggling through in terms of movements from reimbursement to uh, other ACO reserves to other FFP. Um, so uh, you know, I, I kind of went to the um, uh, kind of the, the the major columns and I look at the chart you have there and see that Medicaid out of state moved from uh, 345,000 to 835,000, which is a 41% increase. And I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe that's New Hampshire you know, you know, coming over. And then um, looking at uh, the Vermont Medicaid number going from 1.5 uh, million to 3.2 million, that's a 115% increase, which is a, a big number. And um, and then looking over at commercial going down from 20 million to 19.7 million, and I think cost shift. You know, you're, you're, you've got uh, an increase in Medicaid and a decrease in commercial, and so how does that relate to the cost shift? But I think th this horse has been beaten enough, and, 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 and I, I'll move on. Um, I do uh, kind of want to get maybe your insight into how you feel the transition so under the all payer model might affect the cost shift in one way or another? Well, I think if the experience is unfavorable after all the <coughs> settles, um, which is not what 2018 came out to be, as I understand it from the folks who participated in uh, at least two of the programs in 2018, if that experience is unfavorable, it grows the, cro the, the cost shift. I mean, the cost shift is a seesaw. Um, you, you, you can't push down on one side without the other side going up. It's, it's, it's inherent. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, if we do well in this program by containing costs in render care, 
and, and we do well against the medical expense targets for the system and we're rewarded for that, then that takes pressure off the cost. Uh, million in 2018 to uh, 2 million in 2020, which is a 14% increase over the two-year period. Is um, is that, uh, what, what's the basis for that calculation? It's, it's the basis that they use to calculate the provider tax. So when we finish our budget, we look at the net revenues that are included in that tax, we multiply by the 6% max. So that, is that your number, number, or is that the one Deva would give you the number? So, so the provider. Just to hold off a second, Tom. Could you repeat the question? Um, I'm just wondering if, if uh, my understanding is that some hospitals have received a number based on prior year uh, audit financial statements as to what what to expect for a provider tax number. Um, so, but this is you're just applying the six percent rate. Yeah, we're using the same methodology that Diva would use, um, and we've just applied it to our budget projection. Um, this is kind of a more contextual question. Uh, I've wondered as I've listened to these hearings as people talk about the aging of Vermont um, and thinking about Jess's question in terms of if a Medicare payment was $100, what would the commercial payment be and what would the Medicaid payment be? And so as Vermont ages, people, a portion of folks will be moving out of Medicare as their primary source of insurance into, out of Medicaid as their primary uh, source of insurance and into Medicare. And is that, is that a, um, uh, a substantial migration in terms of uh, payer mix? So you're, you're correct that if folks left the Medicaid program and went into the Medicare program, um, our reimbursement as a percentage of charge would, would improve. And for a critical access hospital, that would probably be diminished by cost per unit going down. So the answer would be somewhere between where we are and where we would be. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. And just a side note, I've, that's a depressing future. Um, if we have a substantial amount of Vermonters who transition their primary payer from Medicaid to Medicare, I think that's a that's a larger statewide non-health care issue that we need to we need to address. Uh, that that. Uh, that's not a sustainable model for statehood, I would say, if everyone's on Medicaid waiting till they get to Medicare. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed in your uh, bad debt presentation in the appendix that um, you sent in uh, 2018 1.5 million to a collections um, and a recovery of $496,000. Um, and I know that that appendix was not, you know, subject to great audits, but uh, th those were the numbers that, that, that you sent us, which is a very, very high collection rate among the other, relative to the other uh, submissions. And I'm just wondering, um, in your awareness of your bad debt um, uh, financial aid program and other hospitals, whether or not you do things uh, that are different uh, than your peers. Well, we all we all think we're special, and uh, um, we we have. Uh, when I got down to Mount Scotty, I had a lot of preconceived uh, concepts of how financial counseling, free care, and bad debt should be administered. And I actually they had a very very good program, so I really did next to nothing to it. Um, we have uh, uh, an excellent financial counseling program. Uh, out what we call outstation, getting people on Medicaid in exchange. Um, our days in AR are fairly low uh, compared to industry average. And I actually came out of the collection agency industry uh, 30 years ago. Uh, don't hold that against me. Uh, and, uh, um, one of the, the metrics we used to use back then is you lose 10% of recovery every month on self-pay dollars. And so if you wait 30 days to bill, you just lost 10% doing nothing. And uh, so uh, because we tend to operate gross days around 36, 38, 39, right in that range there, I think part of the benefit is we're seeing that uh, um, 
that we're getting to that, uh, that person a little bit earlier and reducing that erosion as one thing. The second thing is once you have a consistent process in place and you stick with it, quite frankly, uh, folks are, um, uh, trained sounds like a horrible word, but they understand that's the process and, and, they, and they work with it. And the last thing is, um, you know, I, I had a similar experience at Gifford for, for many years and uh, folks around here pay their bills. And so I can't talk about what's going on in Newport or St. John's Barry or, or wherever, but um, we, we, we keep our, our um, self-pay and, and financial counseling people busy, taking phone calls and working through issues and, uh, and helping people out. So um, I think we've got, I, like I don't even mess with it anymore, I just let the thing run because I'm just gonna mess it up. It works really well right now. We have payment arrangements uh, that we extend to people. I don't know if that's any better or worse than any other organization, but um, we've provided some different ways uh, to encourage people to pay and make it easy for them to pay. Gifford uh, is also really in terms of the kind of exceeding uh, the collection rate uh, among their peers. So I'll take credit for that one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's it for me. Okay, Robin. Thank you. Um, I had a, I'll start with a couple of clarifying questions. Um, uh, I was, I just wanted to clarify uh, one of your answers to the questions about the 1% change in charge. And so you indicated um, the, that your calculation and our staff calculation was about the same at 430 but the value of the charge increase was 202,000. And that, is that because about 12% of your reimbursement is charge-based? Is that the <coughs> difference between that gross number and the value number that you included? The, the only question in, uh, that I can think of from, from the materials was, what was what's your calculation of 1% uh, the net value of a 1% increase versus the amount of care boards. And the, and the answer that I recall in my head was that the difference was the consideration for DISH. Is that the question you're referring to? Yes, but your last sentence is the value of 1% gross increase in charge request is equal to 202K. Yes, so okay. that would be the net value of 1%. Because 12% of your reimbursement is charges as opposed to other fee schedules and stuff like that. I'm just trying to get it to live. Well, we don't, we, don't I, I, we get paid charges on next to nothing. Every day, we, we get a reduction on all of our, all of our billings. So, uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, it's what's left over, yeah. Okay, but I just wanted to make sure I was understanding the, how the math works. Um, I was also noticing in um, the One Care reports uh, about the total cost of care that, while well, as you said, your uh, overall total cost of care is quite low, that you were on the higher side for advanced imaging. And I was curious if that was really you or if that was really more driven by DH or? Um, it's both. Uh, the uh, most prolific orderer of advanced imaging uh, in our HSA is one of our internists. He's also the only 1.0 FTE internist with the largest patient panel, so some of it does track. Yeah. Um, but the, the, uh, the docs at uh, White River Family Practice are contributing to that uh, as well. Um, I had a, a long discussion about the utilization uh, disparities with Megan Johnson from One Care on a 101 walking through the data. And um, it's still at the end of the day talking about s there's small numbers. The, the, yeah. end, the end is pretty small on the actual numbers. It's like talking about the relative risk reduction versus the absolute risk reduction. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's under double digits uh, in, in difference. That said, it is it, something to stay on the radar screen. I, I will admit to having increased anxiety as I looked at the outliers until I saw what our net overall cost was. And I said, well, nobody's perfect, but we're, okay. we're uh, doing well so far. But again, three months of data could, could swing wildly in the next nine. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then the last, uh, I want 
like to just return to the discussion that Jess had with you around the regional planning, and I'm also excited to hear about how that's going. As you know, I'm chairing the Rural Health Services Task Force, and, I, and we're charged with looking at hospital sustainability as well as other healthcare system sustainability in Vermont. Um, and so I'll be very interested to hear more about how that's going. I was curious to know whether at some point you were thinking about including Brattleboro and Cheshire um, as well in that discussion, because at least for the Springfield population, they're kind of in between um, where yeah. you guys are, and obviously um, Claremont's pretty close. Yeah, I mean, it it's an uh, 18 minute drive from yeah. us, to, us to Claremont, and uh, as I'm doing it frequently now, uh, you know, it's 22 minutes down to Springfield. We're, we're still, those three hospitals are still far closer. They're, they're really more nuclear than the further afield hospitals of Brattleboro and Cheshire. I think it's natural that Brattleboro and Cheshire um, move closer together. I think the interesting work being done between DHH and Grant One. Um, will help guide that as well because Monadnock Hospital is a member of Granite One and that's just on the same axis, you know, the, the, the same uh, latitude basically of Brattleboro, Cheshire, and Monadnock. So I think there'll be closer work around them. Um, uh, you know, Springfield patients that get redirected to Brattleboro, I think would much rather get redirected to Manuscutney or to stay in Springfield. It's, yeah. it's that much closer. Yeah. Our, our uh, zip codes overlap um, substantially in our service areas. So uh, I'm, I'm not in, envisioning a, a drive south further than Springfield um, at this point. Uh, I think we've got our hands full with the, the three close in. Great. Um, and then I'm wondering also, as the three of you discuss that, are you also kind of looking at what's going on at Alice Peck Day? Because that's, of course, in Lebanon, so very close as well. Yeah, I mean, my perspective on, on Alice Peck Day is um, you know, they're, they're two and a half, three miles away from, from DH. It's an easy, it, it's easy to move services um, and physicians um, uh, across the, the town of Lebanon. Um, and really they're in a unique situation. Uh, I almost look at them as a department of, of, of DHH um, or DH Lebanon as opposed to someone that would join in on this you know, Southern Windsor County, Sullivan County um, uh, group that we're trying to pull together. ABD is in a unique spot, and as is New London Hospital, the other critical access hospital in the system. Uh, they're in the, the what I've called the DMZ between Dartmouth, Hitchcock, and Lebanon, and Concord, and, and the competing health systems there. Um, all, all the, you know, we're all, you know, uh, all the critical access hospitals have their own market pressures and, and in geographic location that, that kind of uh, guide where they're headed. Well, I think this is great work and I'll be very interested to see yeah. where you land because I do think one of the challenges with that whole quarter is there's a lot of capacity in that in that quarter compared, at least relatively speaking, compared to other areas in Vermont. Yeah, yeah there's, you know, there's 75 inpatient beds in and in a 10 bed rehab for, you know, 35 to 40,000 patients in total. Um, uh, that's a lot of capacity. Um, it's probably too much inpatient capacity. Um, uh, we're, we run pretty full. Um, uh, uh, Valley and Springfield are not at this point, so there's, there's, there's room to move people around, and there's, there's capacity to keep people in our communities as, as opposed to sending them to DH. When DH is full, right. we send them to Cheshire, and, and if they're too sick, they go to Bay State. Or they get UVM, and then I have a call from an irritated uh, CMO at UVM saying, "Why, why can't you handle these people in your in your backyard?" Thank you. Um, and then my last question is whether uh, there has been any discussions with DH about considering to participate in the One Care Network for the Vermont folks, because I know it that wasn't really possible when they were part of the Pioneer ACO, but they're no longer part of that Medicare ACO, so. You know, have, I, there, have there been discussions? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to um, speak for um, the strategic DHH, but I know there's a concerted effort um, underway now um, to better educate, I think, the rest of the DHH senior leadership about what, uh, you know, what DHH's footprint in these, in the alternative, alternative payment models, or the all-payer model, 
uh, is in Vermont. Uh, my sense is that there's a, uh, a, a shift in, in thinking there um, uh, that you know, we, we can't just be the, the, the only footprint in, in, in Vermont as part of the system. Again, it gives us the, being part of the system gives us the ability to, to go in and, and, and take the downside risk. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a complex issue and it's on the radar. That's, that's probably what I can say at this point. Thank you. Unless Wendy wants to chime in. I don't think she does. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm going to start with um, not really a question, but an ask. And I, I, I know that uh, uh, I believe Dartmouth also has a lobbyist in the room. And two years ago, um, when UVM was presenting, they talked about their captive um, being in the in the Caribbean. And Dave mentioned offshore captive today. And at that time, UVM thought that it wouldn't make sense for them to um, consider a Vermont captive. But they went out and they did the research. And of course, I don't get to see the people at DFR like I used to because we've moved our offices. But um, I believe that they switched back to Vermont and it was beneficial for all parties. And I was just wondering if you could ask your colleagues at DH, DHH to take a look at Vermont because Vermont is a world leader in captive insurance, and it'd be nice to see that business here rather than offshore. So, so I, I can, uh, I'll be happy to pass that on, number one. Uh, but number two, um, I, when I use the term offshore captive, that was kind of just like a historical thing that is in my mind together because that used to be the only option. Okay, uh, and, and, but their, their liability coverage is actually split in two. Uh, one, one half of it is out of Bermuda, and one half of it is, is here in Vermont. And so we're, we're half and half, actually. 100% Vermont would be better for <laughs> I, I would be, I would be happy to pass that on. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, you went into great detail about how you calculated both your NPSR and your charges, and really you backed into that based on the margin that you were looking to get. Um, I'm curious on the charge, the 3.2%, the um, if you could talk to us about whether it's across all lines or if it's targeted towards um, strategically um, hitting certain areas, maybe reducing costs in others, and so on. So um, I'll, I'll do this a little backwards. So pharmacy, which covers inpatient, outpatient, ER, clinic, whatever, right, uh, crosses all lines of business. Um, we, we have a, a markup that we use based on cost. We have never changed that markup in the six years I've been there. In other words, we have not garnered uh, any money from that. So whatever we get billed for, you know, we mark it up, and that markup does not change. Uh, so that's essentially a zero percent. Um, for physicians and uh, mid-level providers in our clinics and in hospital settings, it's a 3% um, increase to those charges that they generate. And then for uh, inpatient, inpatient rehab, swing bed, and outpatient, it's 4% blended, a weighted blend uh, would be the 3.2%. Uh, we tried to shoehorn uh, um, a smaller uh, rate increase for outpatient. I think our inpatient charges are kind of okay, but our outpatient have issue. And we've talked about this in some prior hearings where you know we're trying to bend that down and get outpatient uh, more in line with average market. Uh, and we really that was kind of our last fallback position. We can't we can't do a two and a half in outpatient. We've got to we've got to move to at least three and a half. And we're in the data and so, said, oh my gosh, we've got to go to four. So, um, and again, I, if, I, if we were able to solve some of these other issues and I can make that million dollars go away, uh, I'm really going to try to push that towards the outpatient because that's where we have our biggest pricing issue. Okay, great. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, Eric. I am dealing with a new wireless microphone, so hopefully it works. Um, yes. Whoa. Whoa. It doesn't work at all. It went, 
very loud. Don't, don't like that. So, because of the time, I just want to first start with, um, I think it's wonderful how you've expanded your MAT program um, and to the EER, and I think at some point it would be useful to have hospitals get together and try to come up with best practices to deal with substance use disorder and also mental health, and which is a serious problem in the state. And I mean, I think objectively, the population you serve, um, it's a specific challenge in your HSA. Uh, also, uh, embedding a full-time psychiatrist in primary care. Um, so thinking, changing topics a little, um, you know, your 2018 Community Health Needs Assessment, which is uh, quite an interesting read, actually, and uh, I, from my opinion, is a substantial job, and you did a wonderful survey with a very large end. Um, the majority of community survey respondents uh, identified access to affordable health insurance, health care services, and prescription drugs as the overwhelming issue. Um, in recognizing that that's a, substanti a substantially difficult issue to address, um, I've heard in other presentations, hospital budget, this, issue, this tension between access to care or the level of care that can be provided and cost. So you can decrease costs, um, but then you decrease the services provided. From a consumer perspective, if costs remain high and you can't afford to use costs, it also impacts accessibility. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this tension between cost and access from a consumer perspective. Sure. Um, on the, I'll start with access. Um, we've, as, as Dave has already mentioned, we've been invested pretty heavily in, in having navigators uh, for folks um, uh, to get them onto the exchange, uh, to get them onto Medicaid, We've tightened up that process um, substantially, and we, we have a fair number of folks every month that are on our rehab units who we do all of the transition work to get them onto uh, Medicaid. Now, granted, that benefits us as, as well, but that's a, a complex, long journey for patients, and we've you know, invested in helping them get there. We actually are uh, one of our, really one of our finest employees is, is one of those uh, Navigators and as and Dave and I have talked about expanding her role, um, uh, you know, regionally to not just help folks lucky enough to be in Windsor and, and Woodstock, but those closer to Springfield and those over in, in Sullivan County. Um, we've committed to adding FTE in primary care. As I said, we're, we're net positive and substantially with three new, uh, nearly full-time primary care providers. Um, we've had to adjust our clinic staffing uh, to accommodate for uh, part-time providers, of which we have a lot of, and a lot of primary care clinics do have these. There's an article in the, in the Times uh, very recently uh, about how primary care jobs uh, for women have actually offered the most flexibility to have work-life balance, and we've recognized that. Um, so we have providers that, that work a couple of days a week. That, that creates a strain on everybody else. Um, um, because when providers aren't there, someone else has to pick up the slack. But, you know, I, I think we've in, invested in, in, in both. Now, on the cost side, um, you know, I'll echo what, what, what Dave said. I think um, there is, uh, we're hoping to have more room to move to uh, push that increase down um, in our outpatient services, which is, that is, I think, where respondents to the community health needs assessment um, notice more. We do a lot of physical therapy, occupational therapy, specialty work there, that's, that's kind of what we do as a, as a rehab hospital. Um, and and that, that is not cheap, I think that's when people feel it. They see their primary care doc, um, but may have to pay out of pocket for their PT work, so that's where they feel it. And uh, I, I wish I had a better answer on, on prescription drug costs, as Dave said, we really try to hold the line there. So just uh, quickly to explain the prescription drug costs, I wanna, commend you guys on looking at your drug formulary, and I think it has real potential, and I think sticking with it um, is worthwhile, and I think overall, looking across regulatory processes, um, PBMs are the black box in the system right now, 
We hear from one side um, that it's a net saving to the system. We hear from another side that it's a substantial cost driver. And my guess is the answer is somewhere in between the two. Um, but we'll never know that answer unless we're able to try to peel back or look into that black box. So I would hope that um, in the future, in the hospital insurance rate review process, that those type of questions are allowed. Um, so this is a question to try to understand it and not a criticism. So I would have expected with ish consumer issues with affordability, bad debt and free care to both increase. So that's what we see from budget 19 to budget 20. Um, but if you look at budget 19 to projections for 19, you see a substantial increase in bad debt, roughly 26%, and a reduction of roughly 5% in free care. And I was wondering if you could talk about what's driving that. Um, I, th I think a number of uh, drivers, really. Um, what we have seen, even with our navigator work, is um, she's moving most of the people that can get onto the, that are willing to go onto the exchanges, onto the exchanges, uh, uh, and getting the folks that are willing to uh, go through the, the complex journey to get onto Medicaid to do that. And I think that population is, is, is shrinking now. We're getting to the folks that want to be on neither. Um, and I think that's one of the, uh, probably one of the drivers. Um, uh, I don't. I don't have a great answer unless Dave, you have a, a thought on others. And, and again, you know, I think we're still dealing with a small end, mm -hmm. and you know, a couple uh, inpatient surgeries a couple, skews the number greatly. But we've kind of stayed in this band of reasonableness. And uh, I meet with the financial counselors every week. I meet with the care management staff every week to go over uninsured, poorly insured cases that we're seeing in whatever setting. And, um, you know, but it, 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 we're so small, the ebb and flow is, is really tough to, to predict or manage. But if you look over maybe five or six years, we're kind of in a, in a band of reasonableness. And some, uh, you know, if you, I think we had to submit, I don't know if it was in your, your letter or, or the letter to uh, the Greenmount Care Board, you know, the number of denials as a percentage and, and all of that. And, and that's, and you can see there's, there's some fair variation between years because we're, we're talking about a few hundred people receiving benefit or not receiving benefit of that program. So. And um, you triggered a, a memory, not a, not a great one. We had a, a visitor um, who was severely injured, a visitor from Central America, that had an extended stay in our acute rehab um, and uh, no way to pay for it. A bad car accident, multiple, uh, multi-trauma, month plus stay that you know probably accounts for a big chunk of the the, the free care and or bad debt, I think, at this point. Yeah. Actually, that case by itself was well into six figures. And, it, and the problem with this gentleman was he, he was not from this country, but he had three payment sources, potential payment sources, between the United States and his home country. And so we ended up having to, we, we worked with him all while he was there, he and his wife, great people want to do the right thing, but the insurance companies were all pointing fingers to each other as being responsible. There was a workers' comp carrier, there was Medicare, and there was an out-of-country commercial all involved, and nobody wanted to take responsibility. So what we ended up having to do is we wrote that off to bad debt within 30 days of discharge and, and sent it to an attorney to work on his behalf for our benefit to get all this stuff resolved, and that's still, that's still a process. So I've talked uh, with David about our concerns with the booking of um, the reserves, and that's been talked to death. And I just want to echo um, statements that this is a very difficult phase with no historical data. And I think reasonable minds can disagree about what constitutes objective data under GAAP um, principles. And I hope there is guidance. I think. The range idea is interesting. I think whatever the guidance is has to account for the substantial variation between Vermont hospitals and particularly critical access hospitals. 
Uh, I agree, I, and I think there's going to be real work done at the ACO and CMMI level to look at what asymmetric risk looks like. If we want to get small, I'm wearing my ACO hat now, my one care hat. If we want to get small hospitals into the programs comfortably, I think most would say, I don't need any upside benefit. I just need my downside risk managed better. Um, and I, I, I think, again, these asymmetric risk orders are going to be what we move to. But we gotta, we got to get there. we got to get through um, um, you know, our first year in, in Medicare. And just lastly, um, you've talked your substantial patient volumes from out of state, and that's played out also in, from your data and also in, from the VUDS data looking back 30 years. Um, what's the payer mix for that population relative to the Vermont payers population, sir? Sorry. So yeah, we, we actually uh, did look, we do look at that. Um, so it is uh, actually beneficial for us to have New Hampshire patients. Um, and uh, uh, Medicare is uh, a percentage point higher as a percent of business for New Hampshire versus uh, Vermont. So but statistically insignificant, the difference. Uh, but uh, Medicaid is half as a percentage of people coming in. So, um, so it's about 4% of the uh, New Hampshire folks that come in and 10% of the Vermont, 10, 11% of the Vermont people coming in. And then the balance moves to commercial uh, by definition. So uh, we actually have more uh, commercial covered patients coming from New Hampshire as a percentage than we do in Vermont. Thank you so much. That's all our questions. Thank you, Eric. Is there any uh, member of the public who wishes to offer comment on the model scutney budget? Dale. Senator, are you curious to know what the population shifts have actually looked like? I realize what's happening with Springfield and therefore on the Vermont side. I'd be very curious to know if there's something like new housing developments going in near them on the New Hampshire side. I just know that the population shift and very, they can shift very quickly and it's very small moves but make a big difference down there in terms of how people can decide, well, I want to live here this year or I want to live there and it can be like, do I want to live in Etna, New Hampshire, or do I want to live in Lyme, New Hampshire? Um, and I would imagine that would affect who they see <coughs> as a patient from New Hampshire. Um, that's a good question, Dale. Uh, our communities, Windsor, Greater Windsor, Springfield, Claremont are hauntingly similar um, in uh, its, its demographics. That said, there is more business investment in Claremont going on. There are companies there that are trying to attract a younger workforce, I think Red River being one of, of the services, uh, computer and IT services firm that we work with. Um, they are um, grooming local high school students and local college students to come into their workforce um, and have built a really a remarkable uh, space in an old factory, uh, old, old mill building in, in Claremont. Uh, uh, so there, there is, I think, more business development on, on the New Hampshire side, attracting more of the workforce, and that, that I think, explains what Dave just mentioned around the, the higher uh, true commercial payer mix that we see um, in New Hampshire. I think, again, Springfield and Windsor are, are, are very similar, very similar payer mix uh, and demographic. A little bit more change uh, on the Claremont and Sullivan County side in New Hampshire. Thank you. Okay, is there any other public comment? Seeing none, I wish to uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. And I see it's 11.20. We are going to... Um, Take a bio break and resume at 11.30 with Grace Cottage. Thank you. Thank you.